الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Yesterday we were talking about the importance of ikhlas and things that would destroy ikhlas. And as I mentioned, there are two things that normally would destroy the ikhlas. Number one, riya. To do something for showing off. To do it, to show it, to show it to people like us. Prove to people that I'm doing something good. Trying to get some name out of it, out of this ibadah, that if I would perform this ibadah, people will see me performing the ibadah. They will, realize, they will think that this is a great man, I will get some respect, I will get honor. So riya is one of the things that destroys the ikhlas. When we look at the ahadith that talk about riya, only through those ahadith a person can realize how destructive Riyah is <coughs> and how it totally destroys the whole deed, all of our A'mal. As soon as there is little bit of Riyah in something, the whole thing just goes away. And then not only this, a lot of times we may not realize that we are doing it out of Riyah, out of showing off. But in reality, there may be some riyah in it. <coughs> Quickly looking, looking at some of the ahadith. There is a hadith narrated by Imam Tirmizi rahmatullahi alayhi. On the authority of Sayyidina Abu Sa'id ibn Fadalah radiyallahu anhu. Who says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would gather the people on the day of Qiyamah, Nada Munadin, someone will make this announcement. Man kana ashraka fi amalin amilahu lillahi ahadan fal yatlub thawabahu min ghayrillah. Whoever associated any partners with Allah in any of his deeds, which means there was riyah showing off. So the announcement is on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means the angel is making this announcement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that now go and seek the reward of that deed from that person. Don't expect anything from me. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَغْنَ الشُّرَكَاءِ عَنِ الشِّرْكِ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like partners at all. And as soon as there is partnership in any of the ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I don't like to be the partners of anyone, so go give him all of your ibadah, I don't need any of it. Don't bring any partners of my, uh, for, for me in any of your ibadah. As soon as there is a little bit of partnership, you just bring one person, I'll give him 100%, I don't need any of it. Because I don't want no partners. In another hadith, which is narrated in Sunan Ibn Majah by Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiyallahu anhu, he says, خرج علينا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ونحن نتذاكر الدجال. رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم came to us while we were discussing about the fitna of the jal. Sahaba radiyallahu anhu alayhi wa sallam were sitting and discussing the fitna of the jal. And as we know through the hadith that this is one of the worst fitna anyone has to face. To the extent Rasulullah says in a hadith, 
مَامِن نَبِيٍّ إِلَّا وَقَدْ أَنزَرَ أُمَّتَهُ الدَّجَّال Every Prophet of Allah warned his ummah against this fitna of Dajjal. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that for sure it did not come, Dajjal did not come in the previous ummah, so for sure he is going to be coming in this ummah. So some people of this ummah will have to face Dajjal. So Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'een always had this worry about facing the Dajjal and facing the fitna of the Dajjal and how are we going to be protecting ourselves against that fitna. So they were sitting and discussing this matter. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out and he said, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِمَا هُوَ أَخْوَفُ عَلَيْكُمْ عِنْدِي مِنَ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّال Should I inform you of something that scares me about you people more than the Dajjal? Something that is more scary about the Dajjal, a fitna that is worse than the fitna of the Dajjal. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'in said, Sure, Ya Rasulullah, please tell us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ash-shirk al-khafi, the hidden shirk. Hidden shirk. Then he continued, يَقُومَ الرَّجُلِ فَيُصَلِّي فَيُزَيِّنُ صَلَاتَهُ لِمَا يَرَى مِنْ نَظْرِ رَجُلِ That a person is performing salah and he starts beautifying his salah because someone is looking at him. This is shirk al-khafi, hidden shirk. That the person is associating some partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ibadah. He was not beautifying his salah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he started beautifying it for the sake of others. If a person normally finishes his salah in five minutes, today as he is performing the salah, and he sees that someone is watching him, he prolongs his salah. Now the salah that was supposed to finish in five minutes, it took him seven minutes to finish the salah. Five minutes were for the sake of Allah, who the other two minutes were for. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when, when you associate partners with me in ibadah, then I give the whole thing to that person, I don't need any of it. I don't even want the five minutes of your ibadah, I don't even take a second of it, because there are partners there, and I don't like partners. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ He doesn't want partners. In another hadith, narrated by Imam Ahmad in his musnad, on the authority of Shaddad ibn Aws radiyallahu anhu who says, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, مَنْ صَلَّى يُرَائِي فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ A person who would perform the salah and he is showing off with his salah, he is doing a kind of shirk. وَمَنْ صَامَ يُرَائِي فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ And a person who would fast to show off with his fasting, he is committing shirk. وَمَنْ تَصَدَّقَ يُرَائِي فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ And a person who would give a charity because of just to show off, that person is doing shirk. In another hadith, narrated Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu, once he was sitting with his students and he started crying. So they asked him, Mayukik, what makes you cry? So he says, I remembered a hadith that I heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when I remember this hadith, it makes me cry. I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, أَتَخَوَّفُ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي الشِّرْكِ وَالشَّهْوَةِ الْخَفِيَّةِ My fear regarding my ummah is that they will get into shirk and the hidden desire. My fear regarding my ummah is that they will get into shirk and hidden desire. So Shaddad radiallahu anhu says, I asked, Ya Rasulullah, أَتُشْرِكُ أُمَّتُكَ مِنْ بَعْدِكَ Ya Rasulullah, is your ummah going to commit shirk after you? 
I cannot imagine that people, these people will do shirk. Ya Rasulullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, there would commit shirk. But, أَمَا إِنَّهُمْ لَا يَعْبُدُونَ شَمْسًا وَلَا قَبْرًا وَلَا حَجَرًا وَلَا وَثَنَا They will not be worshipping sun, moon, stones or idols. But, وَلَكِنْ يُرَاءُونَ بِأَعْمَالِهِمْ They will be showing off with their deeds. They will be trying to show off, they will try to show off with their deeds and that will be their shirk, the shirk of this ummah. When they are associating partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This ibadah that was supposed to be only and solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the pleasure of Allah, but this person is trying to do it to show it to others and this person is trying to show, do it to get some of his own personal benefit out of it. Shirk. Although a person who would do these type of sins or these type of things, we will not call that person a mushrik. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says this is a shirk al khafi This is hidden shirk. In another hadith, again narrated by Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi in his musnad, on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Musa al Ash'ari radiallahu alayhi in a very important hadith that tells us the depth of the sriya, that how it gets into the heart and the person doesn't even sense it himself. We don't realize that there is riya. The person is doing things out of riya and just to show up and does not himself realize I'm doing it for this purpose. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam especially gave us khutbah on this topic. And he said to us, Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqu hadha shirk. Oh people, refrain from this shirk. Protect yourself against the shirk, which is showing off, riya, showing off. فَإِنَّهُ أَخْفَى مِن دَبِيبِ النَّمْلِ Because this riya is more hidden in the heart then the voice from the steps of an ant, when an ant is walking, what type of noise you would hear from it? Nothing. We can't hear it. There is such a silent noise over there. There is some noise for sure. There is movement. When there is movement, there is noise. But it's so hidden, it's so quiet, that me and you cannot hear it. We cannot even sense it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَإِنَّهُ أَخْفَى مِنْ دَبِيبِ النَّمَلِ This is more hidden in the heart than the steps of an ant. So some of the Sahaba al-Wanu Allahi alayhi wa sallam asked, وَكَيْفَ نَتَّقِيهِ وَهُوَ أَخْفَى مِنْ دَبِيبِ النَّمَلِ Ya Rasulullah, how can we protect ourselves against it if it is more hidden than the steps of the ant? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qulu, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min an nushrika bshay'a, wa nastaghfiruka lima la na'lam. Ya Allah, make this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Ya Allah, we seek your refuge against associating anything as partners with you, knowingly, and we seek your forgiveness against anything that we have done unknowingly. Which means, keep on making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith also, it's a very important hadith that teaches us a very important lesson. And that is, when we feel we are doing something that according to our understanding is out of our control. I really have no control over it. I get into it. For example, a lot of our people will say, we are not able to keep beer because of my job. I'm not, sisters will say, I cannot wear the hijab because of my job. Someone will say that I cannot perform the salah on time because of my job. Someone says I have to lie and cheat because of my job. Someone says I have no halal earning, no sources of halal earning, and that's the only source of my earning, and that is this haram way. People are committing different type of sins. And they are not able to give it up. 
we feel that I have no choice there. I cannot deal with it. I don't know. There is no way that I can get out of it at this time. You can tell me as many hadiths as you want, but this is my problem. I realize that it's my problem, but I'm not able to give it up at this time. So what should this person do? What should we describe for this type of people? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this hadith told, told us that lesson also, that ask these people to make dua. Just like when Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi wa asked you, Rasulullah, if we cannot even sense this type of riyah, hidden riyah, what should we do? He didn't say no, okay, then you don't have to worry about it because you, don't, you can't hear it, you can't sense it. No, you have to make dua now. Keep on making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, every, every situation is in Allah's control. There is nothing out of Allah's control. So if I feel I cannot do it because of my own difficulties, my problems, my situations, make dua to Allah to get us out of the situation. Ya Allah, take, get me out of the situation. Find a way for me, Ya Allah. Make a way easy for me to come out of the situation. Everything is in Allah's control. But normally, we just get totally careless about it. I can't do it, so what can I do? That's it. That's the end of it. Same thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us about this riya. That always make dua to Allah to protect you against riya. That we are knowingly doing it. And of course, a lot of time is knowingly. But in many cases, it will be unknowingly. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, in those cases, make dua to Allah. That Ya Allah was kalima la a'lam. And I seek forgiveness from you for things I done unknowingly. I didn't know it. But I'm a human being. Ya Allah, I make mistakes. Ya Allah, it's my shortcoming. Ya Allah, it was my fault. Please forgive me. I have done so many things unknowingly. So this is one thing that destroys our khalas. That is riya. To do something for showing off. In this regard, we need to remember. A lot of times, shaitan now will trick us. Our nafs will find excuses. And that is, don't do salah in the masjid with the jama'ah. Because when you come to the jama'ah, then you have riyah. You will be showing off. People will look at you, and you feel that you are doing it for the sake of people. So now do salah at home. This is a trick from shaitan. See, shaitan tricks us from every way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it in Quran, that shaitan said it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَمَائِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ Now, since I'm cursed and I'm out of your rahmah, now I will try my best to get these people also to go to Jahannam with me, and for that, أَتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ I will come to you from front and back, from right and left. I will come to them from every side. وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ And because of that, you will see most of them, they will not be grateful to you, Ya Allah. They will not thank you. They will not remember you. Because I will be attacking them front and back, right and left. I will be attacking them. So he keeps on attacking us from every side. Now we are trying to deal with Riyah. And he comes and he says, Okay, I will tell you a good treatment of Riyah. Don't come in the masjid. Don't stay in the masjid. Do your even the fraid, do the fraid also at home, so that no one will see you doing it. Because when you come to the masjid and you perform the salah in the masjid, you feel that people are looking at me and people will feel, MashaAllah, what a nice person, MashaAllah, he comes to the masjid, he comes early, he comes before Adhan, MashaAllah. So now rather than coming to the masjid, stay home so that you are protected against Riyal. This is not the way to treat Riyal. This is in fact another door for, the shaytan, for shaytan to come into our amal. We, we are supposed to do whatever we are ordered to do. Whatever we are ordered to do, just keep on doing it the same way. And all we have to do is, when that feeling of Riyah would come into our heart, say to yourself, I don't care about it. I'm not doing it for this purpose. 
I'm not going to the masjid to show it to people. I'm coming to the masjid for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People can think of me whatever they want. I know my shortcomings. These people who are looking at me coming to the masjid, they think that I'm coming because of my virtuousness, that I'm virtuous. This is why I'm coming. I'm not coming for that. I know I'm going there because I'm full of sins. I really need to get rid of some of these sins. I know myself if I won't come to the masjid. These are nice brothers, alhamdulillah. Even if they won't come to the masjid, they will do salat home. I know if I won't come to the masjid, I will not do salat home. I will keep on postponing the salat. I will miss my sunnahs. I will be lazy to do the salat. Let me just go into the masjid and do it. A lot of a'mal, when the riya, when the feeling of riya comes, we need to remind ourselves of some realities. Someone is crying, making dua and crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A feeling would come, people looking at you that you are crying. But subhanAllah, this is only the sitter of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his sattar subhanahu wa ta'ala. He covers up on our faults. People think that you are crying because you are virtuous. But I'm not crying because I'm virtuous. I'm crying because I'm full of sins. I need the forgiveness for it. If these people would know what sins I'm crying for, they will throw me out of the masjid. After all of this, you are still in the masjid. Get out of the masjid. We don't want you to disturb our stuff here. We don't want your presence over here. We don't want you to make everything dirty over here. Go out of the masjid. This is the sattar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His sattar. He covers it up on us. The person is crying. Everyone thinks that he's crying because he's virtuous. But I'm crying because of all of these sins of mine. That Allah, if Allah will not forgive me for these sins, I will be doomed to the Jahannam. I'm destroyed. There is no way that I'm saved. These people, they don't need to cry. Without crying, they're making good, Alhamdulillah. But for me, if I just spend every portion of my body, every, uh, every uh, uh, water that is in my body, and in fact the blood of my body will come as my tear, and then I get forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will be lucky. So for me, I need to do this. This is my need, so that I get the forgiveness. It's not because I'm very virtuous. We need to remind ourselves of realities. I'm doing this salah or I'm doing extra nawafil, the person comes, he's in atikaf. Now, right away the feeling comes that, are you showing off? This is why you're doing it and right away, you know, naf says, okay, then stop, go to sleep. Shaitan got what he wanted from us. Our nafs got what he wanted from us. Stop us from the ibadah. No, we are not supposed to stop doing the ibadah. Continue doing ibadah. Remind yourself that I need these nawafil, these brothers, mashallah, you know, they are not like me. For them, if they just do the faraid, they will make it safe. But for me, I really need to do a lot of nawafil, a lot of nawafil, before I can make it where they are at this time. This is my fact. I know myself. Just like Hazrat tells us that when he used to go and spend time in Atikaf with Shaykh al Hadith Mu'ana Zakariya, rahmatullahi alayhi. And of course, majority of people over there were ulama. And not just normal ulama, in fact, most of them were great mashayikh of their time. They used to come and spend time with Shaykh al Hadith rahmatullahi alayhi in Atikaf. And especially the people that were very close to Shaykh al Hadith rahmatullahi alayhi, they were great ulama. They are muhaddisin, they are the great muftis in their places, and they are great teachers. There are principles, there are, uh, there are people that are doing great work of deen. So Hazrat tells us that when I used to be there, I used to try to stay up the whole night and then even during the daytime I'll keep on doing as much ibadah as possible because when I used to look at them, these are ulama. For them throughout the year, they are doing the service to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are working for the deen of Allah. So if they sleep at this time, they are doing it okay because throughout the year, they are doing the ibadah of Allah. But for me, this is the only time that I get it to do something really for my deen. Rest of the time, I'm going, I'm at work. And that work is, has nothing to do with this, with the type of work that they are doing. So of course, this type of thought will make him do more than everyone else that is over there. 
And accordingly, of course, then, the Shaykh Rahmatullah is noticing who's doing what. And accordingly, he's getting what he's supposed to get. So, and this is a fact that we need to look at ourselves. When we look at others sleeping, doesn't mean that I can sleep too. I mean, these people didn't do what I have done. For them, even their sleep may be ibadah, especially when I look at, for example, if I'm looking at my teachers, at my mashayah, for, for them, even when they are sleeping, is ibadah. They will have some rest, they will wake up, they will do some good things. For me, even my ibadah is not ibadah. I really need to get even my ibadah to be the true ibadah. So I have a long way to go. I can't compare myself with them over there. So when riya comes, when this feeling of showing off comes in our heart, in our mind, we need to just remind ourselves of this reality that, for me, what is showing off? What is this two rakah salah? What are these eight rakahs? I know what I will do after Ramadan. I know what I had been doing up to this day. So what does this showing off mean for me? If these people will really do some ibadah and they will show off with their ibadah, still, it's worth it, you know, for them, you know, mashallah, they do so much ibadah that they can it's still spare two rakahs to show off with it. But for me, I can't do that. Hardly I'm able to do some rakahs and I can't just lose these ones either. And as I sometime, just to make it simple and easy, give this example, that there are different type of scanners nowadays to scan different type of things. If there was a scanner that could scan what's in our mind, can scan our thoughts, and we will be required to put that scanner on our head when we do the salah. Okay, start the salah and put the scanner in your head. And that scanner has a screen on it. And let people see in the screen what thoughts are going through our mind while we are doing the salah. If that scanner was there, forget about Riyah. We won't come to the masjid because we will be ashamed of our thoughts. We will be ashamed of our souls. That this scanner, there is a screen on it. And if anyone will look into this scanner of what going, what's going through my mind while I'm saying Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, what's going through my mind while I'm saying Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, what's going through my mind while I'm saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, if anyone will look into this, they will for sure tell me, you stay outside. You perform salah there by, by the shoes. And I will be lucky if I'm allowed to stand by the shoes. I mean, we know what goes through our mind. What riya? For me and you, riya is too old of a thing, you know. For people who are really able to do some good things, they could do some riya with it. But for us, with this type of ibadah and riya, the person is doing zikr. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. And look into our mind. Everything is in there. What is happening to my car outside? What's happening at my home? I don't know where is my phone. La ilaha illallah. The person is looking for it. All of these things are here and then what is Riyah? Riyah really should have no room in our hearts and our minds. So these are some facts. That if we remind ourselves of these facts, inshallah this Riyah will run away from us. Will have no room to come to us. So this is one thing. The other thing that destroys our ikhlas is having personal benefit from these type of a'mal. Looking at our personal benefit. If I fast, the benefit is that I couldn't diet for the whole year. Now this is a good time, you know, I will lose some weight. Looking at personal benefits from these a'mal. The person is doing, and of course, it's still in ibadah we are able to control ourselves from looking into these type of personal benefits. But especially when a person is doing any type of work of deen, where he is doing it, of course, work of deen simply means you will be doing, uh, you will be dealing with others. You are teaching someone, you are doing the work, um, and uh, the person is imam somewhere, khatib is giving the khutbah, imam is leading the salah. Now you are doing the work of deen. There is personal benefit there that I can get out of it. After I leave the salah, mashallah, I will get a good name in the people. And now people will take care of my needs. People will look at me, say, me as a great person. These are personal benefits that I'm trying to obtain from the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
that I give da'wah to the Muslims. MashaAllah, 10 people became Muslims. Now, I always have, I mean, I'm proud of this, that I'm, I like everyone to know that I got, this is, this is what I got from my, from my uh, power of speech, that I could uh, impress people, and I could really convince people, 10 people became a Muslim because of my lectures. Now I'm getting good name out of it. So personal benefit could be in the form of worldly materials, that getting some gifts out of it. Now people will start giving me gifts because of this. People will start taking care of my needs and these type of things. When a person starts looking in his heart, he's looking for these type of benefits. And when a person is looking for admiration, for status, for a good name, this is also personal benefit. This is all dunya. Of course, when we are looking, when I'm looking for people to have a lot of respect for me, what is this? This is deen? No, this is dunya. This is all dunya. That my benefit, that people are respecting me. My benefit that I'm having some honor amongst people now. Whenever, whenever I walk in this group of people, people will have respect for me. This is personal benefit. When a person starts looking for personal benefit. And the sign of this is, the way if we, re, if we don't know if we are really looking for it or not, sometime give up the type of work that you feel like doing and do another type of work. For example, a person is doing the work of teaching. At this time, give up the work of teaching and go and recite Quran on your own. Go and visit sick people in the hospital. Go and clean the bathroom in the masjid. And see if you're really getting happy with that ibadah, with that type of work, as much as you are getting happy with this work. I'm here so giving a lecture. I'm happy, alhamdulillah, I'm doing work of deen. Not only because I feel I have a personal benefit out of it. My feeling. That my feeling is, I'm happy only because I'm doing work of deen. Yes, we should be happy about it. But is there any mixing of personal benefit in it or not? I don't know. I think I don't. Okay, let me try myself. Going to clean the bathrooms. At the time of cleaning the bathrooms, do I really feel the same type of happiness that Alhamdulillah I'm doing some work of deen? For the sake of Allah I'm doing something? Or I'm having difficulty, I have to force myself to do it. Why here I'm looking forward to do it and over there I have to force myself to do it. If this is rewarding and that is rewarding, this is for the pleasure of Allah and that is for the pleasure of Allah, then I should be happy in doing both of these. And there are a lot of these type of examples that we can try ourselves with. We all, every person who's doing any kind of work of deen, any type of work of deen, we should sometime do the work in another way, way in different field, and see if that happiness is there or not. Especially as one of our Mashaikh, Sufi Iqbal, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, I remember some of the nasaih he used to give us. And he used to say when you invite people towards, for example, you're inviting people to your masjid, that come and pray in the masjid. So it looks like you're doing work only for the work of deen, for the sake of deen, that come and join us in the jama'ah for the masjid. You are not getting anything from these people. So there is no riyah, of course, and there is no personal benefit in it. It's only for salah. So he says, sometime go and tell people that go and perform salah, invite people in the other area and tell them to go into their local masjid. Don't tell them to come to your masjid. Tell them to go into their local masjid, where you won't be there. So you just go and invite people to go to their local masjid and then you come to your area and you do your masjid, your salah over there. And see if you are having the same, having the same type of happiness for inviting those people or not. If not, simply means, there is personal benefit that you can tell people, MashaAllah, my masjid has these many people. Personal benefit out of it. Hidden riyah. Hidden this, the, the things that are destroying our ikhlas. These things are very hidden in there. They are deep. I go and give a good lecture about the importance of educating children. 
Am I giving that lecture so that people will send their children into my Dar al into our Dar al Or I would be as happy if they would send it to any other Dar al If in reality, I feel the same type of happiness, okay, as long as they go to any of these institutions, wherever their Iman is safe and protected, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy that this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if I'm doing it, if you send it to this place, to this Dar al then they are doing the work of deen. But if they go to any other Dar al then this is not work of deen. Then your children will be destroyed and it's still the same all the same punishments that were there before for them, it's the same thing for them still because they didn't come to my Dar al this, this is personal benefit. And when a person is doing it for that purpose, there is no loss for sure. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave a beautiful example of it in a hadith which is narrated by Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi in his musnad by Mu'az ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu who says, يَكُونُ آخِرُ الزَّمَانِ أَقْوَامٌ إِخْوَانُ الْعَلَانِيَ أَعْدَاءُ السَّرِيرَةِ Before the Day of Judgment, a time will come when people will be friends just to show off. They are just friends from outside, showing friendship. And in their heart, they are enemies of each other. So, just on the, when the person is, uh, you see the person, his treatment, the way he's dealing with, with others, it looks like they are very good friends. They like each other. They love each other. But, inside their heart, they don't like each other. And we have seen it a lot of times. MashaAllah, good brother, you see, Assalamu Alaikum. I travel somewhere. And someone said to me, there is a brother who came from there and he was just talking against the Arulam. Continuously he's talking against the Arulam. He comes over here, Masha'Allah. In their heart, they carry animosity. On their face, they will show you a lot of respect, a lot of love. So Sahaba Ridwan Allah asked, فَكَيْفَ يَكُونُ ذَلِكَ Why that would be this way, Ya Rasulullah? Why people would do it that way? Why they will have this nifaq? Why wouldn't they just say it on the face that I don't like you because of this and this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, because they will be looking at personal benefit from each other. رَغْبَةِ بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضُ They will be looking at personal benefit from each other. I respect him, he will respect me too. They are looking at personal benefit from each other and وَرَهْبَةِ بَعْضُهِمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضُ And they will be afraid of each other in the heart. In their heart, both are afraid of each other that I know he doesn't like me. I'm smiling to him, mashallah. Nice brother, how are you, mashallah? Come. And in my heart, I know he doesn't like me. I'm afraid of his, his, his shar, his fitna. And he's afraid of my shar and my fitna. He knows that I don't like him either. So in our heart, we both know about each other. We don't like each other. But mashallah, we both are showing it to each other as we know one is more love to me than you, than you are, mashallah. This is nifaq. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that it will be so much that people will go to this level. Amongst the Sahaba radhwanullahi alayhi wa this was something unknown over there because they were very straightforward people. You don't like me, you will right away the person will tell him, you know, I don't like you because of this. And that person can clarify, he can tell him whatever reasons for doing this are, but he will, they will be straightforward. But we know it. A sahabi makes a mistake. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is at the, uh, before Fath Makkah, when the sahabi, uh, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu anhu, sent a letter to the kuffar of Quraysh. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got the letter right away, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was upset on his face. Ya Rasulullah, allow me to kill him. He's not going behind, the back, behind his back. Later on, Ya Rasulullah, how about I take care of him? And uh, Umar, I mean, those Sahaba were not like that. That on his face, MashaAllah, Salaam Alaikum. And behind his back, Ya Rasulullah, he's munafiq. No, Umar radiallahu anhu, on his face. Ya Rasulullah, allow me to kill him. And he's standing there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, No, Ya Rasulullah, no, 
Don't you know that he was there with us with the battle of Badr? And Allah has forgiven the people of Badr? They, all of their mistakes are forgiven. All of their sins are forgiven. They will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed them the forgiveness. As soon as Umar hears this, he hugs him and says, MashaAllah, my, you're my brother. They're clean people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is why when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, Sahaba couldn't figure out why people would do something like this. That they don't like each other, they hate each other inside their hearts, and they will just show uh, friendship when they meet each other. So, the point is that these type of personal benefits, this is something that destroys our ikhlas. That the person is doing a amal, doing some good deed, he's, doing, he's giving donation to the masjid, but he's looking at personal benefit out of it. That if I give donation to the masjid, then my word will be heard over here. Then I can see whatever I want in this masjid. And we know it in the majority of the Messiah, I mean, uh, who, who, who say will be accepted, you know, who, who can make a decision? The people who are giving the donations. The poor people, they can't say anything about anything. So this is personal benefit out of what the person is doing, was supposed to be only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the person is looking for some personal benefit out of it. Out of it. So these two things destroy our riyah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us against all of these diseases. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our a'mal and give us tawfiq to do a'mal with complete ikhlas and sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب